My name is Philippe Gott, and uh, they asked me to do this talk on Sir Rogar Ockernam, so the revolutionary cure. Um, my dad's talks uh, many times in Bali about Rogue and so many different types of Rogue, but Nam is a cure to all of them. So I'd like to start off with this picture. Does anyone recognise this still from which film is this from? Ancient. Is that Limitless? Sorry? Limitless. No, not even this. Someone said it. Someone shout it out. You can definitely have it. Matrix. 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 Do you want to know what happens in this scene? Yeah. Yeah. No. Do you want to explain? No. Is it coming from the camera? Someone else. Someone else. Pop the camera. Go on. Because then you give we give them the opposite of two films. Yeah. Why they live in like this fake world? Yeah. Why they can go to they can stop living in the fake world, living in the real world. Okay. So it's kind of like this camp really. It's kind of like the key one. It's kind of like the Lego. So he offers Morpheus offers Neo in the Matrix. It's a great film. You guys should watch it. Great. My art concept, I don't think it's going very well. So he offers a pill, the red pill. He can either wake up from this fake world, my world, if you want, uh, like this camp, and then uh, realise how the world's fake and then aim to get out of the matrix or uh, you know, destroy the matrix. Or he can live in the world just like he is now, go back to his life and take the blue pill. That's kind of like camp. You can either learn from the experience and realise that my art and the world is also false and that you're in this sort of like almost like a dream like state. Or you can just go back to your lives at the end of it and carry on. <coughs> so, in terms of Sikhi, in Bali, Maharaja prescribes disease so many different ways. But two main ways, the two main words used are rog and tab. First one, rog, just uh, briefly skipping over this, there's a couple of types of rog, adi, which are uh, the diseases um, of the mind, so these are anxiety related diseases, stress, uh, if you want. And biadi are like diseases of the, uh, the, the body, and then upadi are sort of like diseases, uh, social diseases almost, like deception. And then you've got da. Don't worry about the words. Um, the first type of da, Maya says, Tine da nivaranara. There's three types of da that Maya gets rid of. The first type are adiyatmi da. These are any sort of disease that come from either within the body, that originate from the body, or they originate from the mind. The other type are adipatic like, uh, da. These are like any sort of disease that comes from the outside, from some sort of like um, animated object. So, like a mosquito or any sort of animal, a mosquito giving someone malaria is uh, adipatic type disease. And the third type are adidervic. These are things uh, like, for example, environmental factors. So if you get heat stroke as a result of the sun, this is one of the types of diseases. And I've got a particular interest in this, I probably should mention. I'm a medical student, so that's why um, I'll be covering both from the sicky aspect and from the science aspect. So broadly speaking, for the purpose of this talk, there'll be three sections. Mind, disease of the mind, disease of the body, and diseases of the soul. So in terms of the body, damn. what's the purpose of the body? <laughs> Go on, it's so much higher. What do you think the purpose of the body is? I kind of put it up already, but go on. Go on, someone shout it out. You can just literally say what was on the slide. Facilitate. Okay, what do you mean by facilitates the soul? <laughs> go on. Um, I guess it, it's like, you know, like the vessel. Okay. Like, it takes care of it. Okay, okay. Um, would you say that it's. It's basically that it animates an unanimated object. So the soul is uh, can't do anything by itself, the body's almost like a kapra. For the soul, like I said, like a vessel for it to act within in this life, to do the actions with it. Yeah. So the body uh, it facilitates the soul. So essentially, it's made up of cells. I'm sure, like you all know, but there's a couple of things that can go wrong with cells in terms of disease. So you can get infected. So you get stuff like uh, you get fever, typhoid, these sort of problems. They can grow out of control, and you get tumors, cancer. Um, cells can die, and you get stuff like dementia or uh, you know, following a stroke. People don't have uh, the same. Uh, the nerve cells die. They can um, end up fighting themselves. So when the body's attacked in autoimmune diseases, like you know, minor things like asthma, eczema, these things, where the body is actually attacking itself, then you get cells that are destroyed, um, perhaps because of trauma. Like if you have a car crash, then you obviously you know um, your organs or whatever are affected by this. And also, you can have congenital diseases where cells are born not born. So this is from a science perspective. How does science then fit into the explanation that Sicky gives for why we have these diseases and why all problem is? Well, science is an incomplete truth. It's almost like the tip of the iceberg. The iceberg is the incomplete complete truth that Sikhi gives you. A good example, a good analogy you could say is that like, Maharaj talks in Gunanjali Jumai says, Pata la, pata la. There's a hundreds and, There are hundreds and thousands of galaxies and uh, solar systems. At the time when Maharaj said it, people probably thought Maharaj was fabricating these things because there was no scientific proof for them. But a couple of, you know, a few decades later, Galileo proved that actually with, you know, scientific instruments that there are uh, other uh, suns and uh, other solar systems out there. Just like this, many things today that Sikhi states, which is a, Sikhi is the complete truth. Maharaj has told, shows everything. But the problem with science is that it only has a focus, a small, what it can see is what it shows you, and it's not the entire picture. But recently, there's been lots of there have been lots of studies um, into what actually happened with meditation. 
So electrical conduction in the brain changes when you meditate. Not just changes, uh, it, it changes in a way different from, how, different from anything else. So when you sleep it changes, when you're uh, in a coma it changes, but this is a different type of change. And this is sort of like science tapping into the, sort of, the wonders of meditation, the wonders of Sikhi. But very, 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 it's, it's very much at the start of it and there's a lot, 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 there's a lot more to grasp yet. So in terms of preventing disease, and how can you prevent disease as a Guru Sikh? Maharaj has given us this code of conduct, this Rehtamayada, in order to live our lives, not just for spiritual purposes, but Maharaj has thought beyond the scope of just you know, our spiritual gain, also about this, this day, this body. And one of the basic, basic things a Guru Sikh does is avoid Bujjarkata, the four cardinal sins. These are there to uh, ex- allow us to excel spiritually, but also to stop us um, developing disease. The first one of this is hookah, tobacco. Consuming tobacco in Sikhi is pro- prohibited, but if you just look at it from a medical perspective, there are so many campaigns now in the world stating that you shouldn't, you know, it causes cancer, it <coughs> causes, uh, you know, clogs your arteries, all these things. And Maharaj had said a long time ago, Gobind Maharaj said that if a person consumes marijuana, then they ruin themselves. But if a person consumes uh, alcohol, they ruin their entire family. But if someone is to consume tobacco, they, enti- they ruin many, many generations yet to come. And if you look at it from a scientific perspective, taking something that causes cancer, uh, it changes the DNA. And if you change DNA in germline cells, sperm cells and egg cells, then you're passing all those mutations to your generation. So your next generation is more likely to gain cancer. Why did you thought about this from the very beginning? In addition to this, you've got hajama, cutting your gaze. People don't realise that cutting your gaze has such a profound effect on your body. Gaze provide a physical barrier between your skin or your body and the external environment. If you remove gears and you take, you know, you take gears out the pores, you're providing a portal for entry for germs and like bacteria, viruses in order to get into your body. And it's not actually, you know, doctors will agree that it's not actually that <coughs> beneficial, it's not beneficial at all if you, to move your gears for cleanliness. Um, next you have halal or eating meat. You can name uh, many, many diseases from where it goes in for mouth cancers, including uh, both tobacco and meat, mouth cancer, esophageal cancer, tracheal cancer, everywhere it goes, stomach cancer, liver cancer, all these, the, re- the incidence of these diseases is increased if you have red meat or if you have tobacco. And not just that, but if you're eating something, if you're actually eating fat, then you're obviously going to get fat. If you're eating uh, another being that has, potentially has diseases, I, I know that um, meat is screened for, you know, not having obvious diseases, but for example, if you have chicken pox, you may not know this, but the chickenpox virus stays in your uh, in your system for many, many years, and that's why when people in their 80s get problems like um, shingles, shingles is actually just reactivated chickenpox, which they've had in their nerve cells for their entire life. So these diseases stay within the body, and you're consuming them, you're naturally going to get it. The next thing we've got is haram, having more than one, having a relationship outside of marriage. Marriage has said, Guru Gobind Singh said, Eko nari jati hoi. So if someone has one partner, they, they are still considered pure, they are still considered celibate. And with this concept, if you, you know, stick to Rehat and you stick to uh, having one partner, then you know that you're not going to get problems like HIV or hepatitis, these sort of you know, sexually transmitted diseases that are so rampant, so common. You, we may not realise it because we live in a good uh, you know, community, but as a medic, you realise that these people don't, are not concerned about the disease status of other people that they uh, are intimate with. And it's quite... It's, Quite ridiculous to us, but it happens in the world, and it's, you, you wonder why people don't think of these things in advance. The and then, you know, they develop diseases like HIV that are life-changing, life-limiting. In addition to the Buddha Gretha, Maharaj, you know, has also given us up this in Bani. So Maharaj says, nindra. We should eat little, and we should sleep little. And this just means that we are more active, we're less lazy, and in addition, we're not just... Um, <coughs> if we're eating less, then you're going to be... you're going to have less diseases. And if you're sleeping less, then you're going to be more active and uh, you know lead a healthy, lead a healthier lifestyle. And when I said Bani, Asa Mansa Sabitiyaki Jagate Rehe Nirasa. So those people that have that are desireless, that don't have desire in this world, they uh, you know they, they're less likely to want to eat certain things or taste certain things. So they're less likely to consume salt. So if you if you have less salt, you have low blood pressure. You have less chance of getting stomach cancer. If you have less sugar, obviously you have less like you know chance of being obese or developing diabetes. That's all fine and well from the science side of things, but how does Sikhi explain disease and uh, you know why we why some people get certain diseases, why people lead disease-free lives? And the answer to this is karam. This is a really good picture in terms of highlight because a lot of people say that how are we responsible for actions that we did a t- some time ago that we can't, they're not really not aware of. But at some point, you obviously like uh, did something to cause um, the repercussions that you're facing now. So like this, see, obviously 
you know, push a domino somewhere that now you're being hit from the other side. And at the time of Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj, a lot of the Sikhs had similar questions. And Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj directed this question to Pai Daya Singh Ji, who was the first Panjabiyara to stand up when Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj in Vasaki in 1699 asked for someone to give their head. Pai Daya Singh Ji stood up. And because Pai Daya Singh Ji had so much gyan, Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj told the Sangat who had the questions about Garam and many other atomic soul uh, spiritual questions to direct their questions to Pai Daya Singh Ji. And so the Sangat, the first, the first question that the Sangat asked was, who has Garam? And by the essence, he said that the, to have karam, you need three, uh, three things are essential. The first thing you need is a mind. Let's call it a mind for now. It's called the antah karam. By surprise, he explained yesterday about this mind concept. It has four parts to it. Man, buddh, jit, hankar. We'll go into that later and explain what the mind is. But you need a mind. The reason you need a mind is because this is where the karam live. This is what karam, karam are created because of the mind. So the first thing you need is mind. The second thing you need is jit and a soul. You need a soul because the soul powers the karam. If the karam were uh, stuck to, say, this body, once this body died, then you wouldn't, those karam wouldn't transgress onto, uh, you know, they would carry on after every life. But because they stick to the soul, they, ca they carry on every time you die, you carry the karam that you had from the previous life. So the next thing that you need is a gyanata, ignorance. And if you're, the reason you need ignorance is because if you have gyan about karam, if you know that uh, these karam are going to, be my downfall, or these guys are going to call, cause me back to be in this rebirth cycle, then you won't commit them in the first place. So these are three things that you need. So where do Karam live? We talked about this mind, this Anteh Karam, that Baji was on about yesterday, and it's, you could say it's the mind, but it actually has four concepts, four parts to it. So the first part is this man. This, you, you, hear this, you hear this term man all the time. Man can be, you can say the whole thing is like your man, it's in your you know, brain, or people, some people say it's the heart. What Anteh Karam actually translates to is inner organ. This inner organ, or this sort of like, you know, um, this brain or whatever you want to say. So the first part of it is mind. The mind is where your desires are created. You may have a desire to do something that, you know, that, uh, oh, I feel like doing this or I feel like doing that. That's the mind part of the Antekan. The next part is intellect. Your uh, ability to differentiate between objects, so the fact that this is a laptop and this is a piece of paper. Your buddha, not, yeah, so your buddha, so man, and then the next one is buddha, your intellect, the ability to differentiate between objects. And the next one is your conscious. This is your ability to think, so your jit. Um, and the next part is your ego, your hankar. This isn't just like the conscious ego where you're having to, you know, say you're saying things like this is mine, this belongs to me. But it's just a really subtle thing where you think that this this body actually belongs to you. So you associate this body as mine. So instead of thinking, instead of realizing that you're actually the soul, you associate yourself with this body and think that you know, mira hat or mira bed. But it's actually you don't realize that this you are indifferent from this body. You, this body doesn't actually belong to you. So this is where God live. So going back to the who has karam, so you know that you need a mind, you need a soul, and you need ignorance. If you don't have any of one of these things, then you won't have karam. So if you get, if you destroy the mind, that Mara says manaji thejaji. If you destroy the mind, then you won't have karam. Again, if you destroy ignorance and you you know you gain gyan about uh, the soul and what the soul is and you know what its path is and how to get rid of karam, then you won't have karam. So these are the the three things that are required for karam. So there's three types of karam. These are they've got. Three different names, but they're essentially the same thing in different parts of time. So you have Giriman Karam, Sanchit Karam, Paralabhut Karam. Giriya is like daily activity. So if you're doing something, you know, Giriya Karni, like, uh, you know, I don't know, I'm saying, I'm walking along or something, that's the Giriya, or, you know, eating breakfast is a Giriya. So these, when the action is being done at that present moment in time, it's called Giriman. When it's being stored, so you've done the action, say for the day's Karam, these are called Sanchit Karam, so they've been stored in some sort of, you know, vessel, if you want the mind. And then the next, when they have been collected up and they part, when they've been collected up and they're now in use, they're called Paralabhut. So the analogy that I'd use is, for example, say you're getting married, let's say it's August the 1st. When August the 1st is in the future, that the, the date is still the same, August the 1st, but at the moment, relative to where you are in time, that date is in the future. When it is August the 1st, it's the present and it's that day. That date's the same, but relative to time, you've now moved. Just like that, Gaiman Gun becomes Sanctuary Gun. And then afterwards, once you've passed August the 1st, you've now got Paralabhad Gun. It's, it's, it's become the past action. And in this way, Giriman becomes Sanjit, become Paralabhad. So if you collect Giriman, they become Sanjit. And once you die, the next random collection of Sanjit that you're born with is called Paralabhad. There's another analogy that was used to explain this by by the by, by, by This was the this was the analogy of using arrows in a quiver. So a quiver is a bag full of arrows. If you have arrows in the quiver, in the bag, this is like Giriman Karam. They're just in there. And you have control over the arrows. The next type, Sanjit, 
are like having arrows in a bow. So if you've got arrows in a bow, or if you've got arrows in a bag, you still have control over these guns, you can still change them. But the third type of balalaba, these are arrows that have been shot already. If an arrow's been shot, it's after your control, and it's only going to stop once it hits something, once it hits a tree, say, or its target. But you can't bring it back, you can't control this. And in this way, by the essence, you explain that you can change the first two sets of karma, you can change balalaba, you can change samtit, and you can change giriman karma by understanding not to create them or understanding how they're created, but you can't change Baralabad Karam just by understanding things. So this begs the question as to how can you change Baralabad Karam then? So the way that you can change Baralabad Karam is that they are only destroyed when, they, when the fun of them is received. So they only, they only stop going when, once they've hit the tree. They only stop going once they hit the target. And this means that if you have Gyan about Karam, if you know that uh, you, know, you can change your Karam, that's only going to achieve so much. Knowing or understanding is only going to achieve so much if these garam are already out of your control. So the only thing that can... Okay, we'll go on to later about how you can get rid of them, but there is an exception to getting rid of them, and that is Nam and Bari. But there are three types of Baralabad garam. There are three types of these garam that you're born with. The first are, are Jati Baralabad garam, the type that you... the type that determine how and where you're born. So the sort of, you know, the family that you're born into, how, how educated you're going to be, the friends that you're going to have, what sort of parents you're going to have, whether you have brothers and sisters, whether you're uh, you know, quite well off, the opportunities that are available to you are determined by these jati paralabhaka, these bonds that regard your birth. The next lot are the ones that uh, determine how your life's going to be, so arbhaka, these are how long your life's going to be, how short your life's going to be, perhaps you're going to have a really long life that's disease free, or you're going to have a quite short life that's quite full of disease, maybe you'll spend your life in hospital, perhaps you'll spend it in jail. These are the ones that determine how long and how your life's going to be. The next lot are the Borg Baralabad Karam. This is quite an interesting concept, I thought, because it's about the perception of how, what you perceive yourself to be. So it's not actually how Duki and how Suki you are, but it's how Duki you think you are, or how Suki you think you are. So you may think that you are the most well-off person in the world, and you may be really, really poor, but you may think yourself to be quite Suki, to be quite well-off and have lots of opportunities available to you. And as a result, you've actually got good Karam, because you as an individual believe this. In this way, people, uh, whether how some how rich or powerful, how weak or poor someone thinks they are, and also how beautiful someone thinks they are. These are all determined by Bala Labad Karam. So there's a nice sakhi that sums this up, by, um, it, that comes in if they have. It's not so necessarily a Sikh history, but it's a good example that Maharaj has used to uh, you know, illustrate how Bala Labad Karam work. And the story goes something like, there was a king and he had, uh, he had a prince, and his prince was married to a princess. And one day the princess killed the prince. And when she was asked, because she was the first person on the scene, when she was asked who killed the prince, she said, she pointed at the first person who was there, and she said he killed him. And the, point, the person she pointed to was a sabal, was a holy man. And as a result, his hand was cut off. Um, actually, I'm aware of time. Okay, I'll just have to speed up, sorry. Um, and his hand was cut off as a result. And um, because his hand was cut off, he thought to himself, like, you know, he's a holy man. What have I done? I must have done something in order to, you know, have my hand cut off, because I've not done anything in this life. And he thought, ask someone who knows, who has more knowledge than me. So he went to go see a pundit, a scholar. A pundit someone who has knowledge about scriptures. So he went to go see a pundit about this. And he came to the pundit and he said, you know, what have I done that's caused me to have such garam that my hand's been chopped off for no reason? And the pundit explained to him that in his past life he was also a sadhu, uh, you know, a holy man. And one day he was in, a, he was in the jungle and he was doing, he was, had a mala and he was fearing his mala. He was like, he had rosary beads and he was doing simra and he was doing his job. And because of he was doing his job, he wasn't speaking. So as he was doing his job, a cow sort of strode past. And when the cow strode past, he took no notice of it because he was just carrying on with his job. And the next thing you know, a butcher walked past and he asked him which way the cow went. And because he was doing the job, he didn't say anything. He just did a shout out that, you know, that the cow went this way. And with his hand, he pointed towards, the let's say, the left. And as a result, in this life, because his hand was responsible for the death of that cow, even though he didn't perhaps intend it to be, he now had his hand chopped off as a result. And the cow in that life was the princess here, and the butcher was born as a prince. And because they owed each other garam, the garam were reciprocated, it was swapped. So now the cow had killed the butcher, essentially, in this life. And the pundit said, the sadhu said, that's all fair and well, but he saw that the pundit's wife was really mean, like she was really, really have a go, having a go at him all the time. And she was like, he said to him that you know all about garam, why is it that you married to her then? What has caused your garam? to be married to this woman. She's so horrible and evil. And he explained that, I'll tell you about that too, he said, in my past life, I was a crow and she was a, she was a donkey. And 
and there was something on her back at some point and I was looking at it and thinking, you know what, I'd like to, I can't remember what it was now, maybe like a tick or something, I'd like to get that off her back because that's what crows like do, they'd like to peck at things. And he saw, okay, so he flew over to the donkey and he started pecking at her back and, uh, <laughs> I'll grab the and he started pecking at her back and um, he kept pecking at it to get it off and he eventually got like, he ripped her skin and he kept pecking at it, kept pecking at it and she was obviously in pain and she was trying to get this uh, crow off her back. So she walked into the uh, walked into the river that was close by, and then he's still trying to peck at this, and then his junge got stuck, his beak got stuck into her hide, and she's trying to get him off, and he's like still can't get his junge out, and she kept walking into the water, walking into the water, and eventually they both drowned, and because as a result of the pain that he caused her in that life, he was now responsible to be married to her, and her to cause the same pain to her. <laughs> But that's all, so you can change your you can change your garden by uh, understanding. You, seem to, you can change some garden by understanding them and not committing them. But what about this parallel of the garden? Mara says, Gurka sabd kaate kote karam. The shabad, the naam that Mara has given us can cut Bani and Vahidu Simran, can cut hundreds of millions of garden. It's not that, you know, for other people, they can't change their garden, but Mara can change our garden in an instant. Even these garden that are apparently the ones that you can't destroy. A really nice Aki at the time of Gurnar Devji Maharaj explains this quite well. At the time of Gurnar Devji, Maharaj is in Gurdarpur and there was a Sikh and his friend there. He might have heard stuff, it's quite common. His Sikh, the Sikh went to go see Gurnar Devji Maharaj every day and his friend would do kukarams, like bad actions, go see a prostitute. One day on the way to see Gurnar Devji Maharaj, this Sikh uh, had uh, a thorn in his foot, he felt like while he was walking he got a thorn in his foot and he met his friend on the way there. And his friend said to him that you see good nadi you manage every day, and this is the fall that you get for it. This is the fruit of your, uh, you know, this is the reward, the reward that you get for seeing good nadi every day, uh, a thorn in your foot. And he said, I go do things that I know are terrible, and yet this morning I found a pot full of uh, coals, and in the pot full of coals there was a gold coin. That's the if that's the uh, the fruit that I received for going see for doing really bad actions. What's the point of seeing good nadi <coughs> if they can't even like you know remove these these uh, dog for you? And the Sikh thought to himself that I'm sure there's more to it than this. Gurnath Devji Maharaj is the jaw of a Garbrook. He's This is actually why you on, on earth if you want. Why, what, oh, there has to be more to this. So that Sikh went to see Gurnath Devji Maharaj and he asked Gurnath Devji Maharaj that what's happening Maharaj? Why is it that this happened, that I've got a thorn, thorn in my foot and he does Gurgara and he does such bad actions and he found a gold coin? What's, please explain to me how this works. And Gurnath Devji Maharaj explained that today, according to your Paralabh Karam, according to your past actions, today was the day that you were going to be killed. In India, they used to have this uh, system of suri te jarana. They said, like, you might think it needs to be hung, but actually suri was like a, a stick that was, people were impaled on the stick. So until the st stick run all the way through these people, uh, they, they didn't die. So according to your parallel of Karam, you were supposed to be impaled on this stick. But because of the fall of just coming to Sangat every day and doing Gitan, uh, listen to Gitan, and having, my, having their darshan, when I did my darshan, his Garam will cut from this suli, this massive stick that he was supposed to be impaled on, to a tiny thorn. This was the ability, this was the power that Maharaj had in terms of, in order to decrease uh, Garam. The next thing he asked was, well then, Maharaj, if that's the case with me, what about my friend who's obviously, you know, like, does such disgusting actions? What about him? Why is he getting fathered? Why is he getting such a reward for this? And Maharaj explained that in his past life, he'd done dan, he'd donated a gold coin. And as a result of donating a gold coin, he'd now... Uh, he was supposed to get a whole pot full of coins, but because of his back, his actions were so bad, they decreased his jungle paralabad karam, his good paralabad karam, were decreased, and as a result, he only got one gold coin, the same gold coin that he'd given as donation. So we talked about paralabad karam were destroyed by, um, you know, by by shabad and by doing nam simran, you can reduce these the arrows that have been shot. But what about the arrows in the bag and the arrows uh, in the bow? What about these arrows? What about the karam that we're creating every day? How can we stop creating them and how can we destroy them? The massive destroyer that Maharaj has blessed us with is Gyan, knowledge. The best thing we can do is, you know, gain knowledge of uh, the Dakaram and then stop committing them. So, the, we know that the Dakaram live in the mind, so how can, we de how can we destroy the mind? The first thing is to understand what the mind is. The mind is something, the definition of the mind is something that sees something that's true, sat, and makes it a sat. It understands it to be not true. So, for example, or and the other way around as well, so anything that is false, it makes it true. So Maharaj says in Bani Jyoti Se, So Jalan Maharaj. Everything that you can see is actually gonna is gonna perish. Everything is Maya. Everything that you see is gonna is is false. It just appears. It's part of that matrix. It appears to be there, but it's actually not. It's not real. It's part of the dream, if you want. But our mind is such that it believes it to be real. It believes it. No, this is it. This is here. All the all the things that I want and all the things that I see. These are things that I the things that I see are the things that I should have because. 
you know, it's so, it's so false that it makes the true stuff look false and the false stuff look true. So the way we can change it, the way we can change it so that it sees the true as true and the false and false is with this jnana of the Atma. So for example, if I see someone, um, you know, if someone's, uh, if so, so recently my friend had, a close friend of mine had an accident uh, last week and she was on the motorway and really, really close, she, they could have died. Um, it was a lorry that hit a car. And I thought to myself that I'm so glad that she's not dead, I'm so glad that she's alive. There's, there, there was a possibility that she could have died. And then because I was doing this talk, I was listening to Gata about this, I thought to myself that there was a possibility, I can't believe I just thought that there's a possibility she could have died. When the only thing that's definite in this life, like they say in Britain, they say well, the only thing that's definite is death and taxes. I'm sure you can find a way of avoiding taxes, but there's probably no way of avoiding death. The only thing for certain is death, and yet I will still find my mind saying, well, there's a possibility she could have died, when actually there's a definite, definite that she's going to die. But our mind just doesn't seem to accept it. It doesn't seem to want to accept the fact that all we see, we can say it as much as we like, but we don't actually accept the fact that all we see is perishable. And the way we can, uh, the way we can change this mind from seeing false as true and true as false is by this gyan, the atma. So the understanding what, you know, what is actually true, the fact that stuff that we can't see, that our soul, na, mara, these things are true and we should focus on these. And a good analogy of destroying the mind is like, say if the mind is like a barn, say like a house, and all the garam in it are ma like massive stacks of seeds in this house. If we, set, if we set the house on fire, we'll destroy both the seeds and we'll destroy the house. And the seeds are the garam. So if you destroy the house and you completely charred these garam, well, if you try and take the seeds and plant them again, they're not going to be able to plant. You're not going to grow anything out of these. So if you destroy the mind, if you destroy the mind, then you're not going to have any garam left. And just like this, Giriman Garam too, the ones we're making every day, these Garam, uh, you know, they don't stick to people who do Bhagati. People like Bhagati Rav these, these Garam don't stick to them. And the reason they don't stick to them is because they have no Mahalgar, they have no more desire. It's no longer about, oh, I want to do this, or I want to do that, or I don't want to do this, or I don't want to do that. They, everything that they do and they say is with Maharaj and Kirpa. They no longer feel that they're actually doing something. They suffer like, Maharaj, obviously, Kirpa, because of you, Maharaj, to see Bani Kodai, to see Kirpa Kari. Maharaj, these are the sort of things that Gursikh not just say, but they actually believe. And they live in the Pana, and they live in the will of So they actually live in the will of Maharaj, without any desire. They have no desire to do anything, or say anything. They no longer say stuff like, oh, we did an Akhan or I did an Akhan Or say stuff like, oh, I didn't do an Akhan Because they realise that they are actually incapable of doing anything. A really nice um, Saki that sums this up is about Pai Ram Koyaji. By Ram Koyaji was a, a good sixth time Guru Gobi Siddhi Maharaj who had a really, really high spiritual avastha, spiritual state. And they were so Gurakata, they were so indifferent and detached from the entire world that when it came to their eating time, when it came to their time that they had dinner, they would, uh, they had seva, because they had people, the Gursiks that did their seva, and Gursiks would come up to them and say, Maharaj, uh, Kanda Maharaj, you're hungry now. And they would say, the good sisters, how do you know that I'm hungry? And they say, my summer hog is time now, you're probably hungry. You're hungry. And then by around Guruji would start eating. And then after a while, these good sisters would say, Tika my to see to see Raji Gimon. And then by around Guruji would say that how do you know that I'm full? Like, you know, how would you know this? Uh, if you say I'm full, then I'll stop eating. But by they told by around Guruji that we have a string that we tie around your stomach, my right? And when this string reaches a certain point, when your weight, you know, your uh, abdomen increases, then we stop when we say you're full now, my right? And then uh, Bhai Rangkoji said, yeah, that's fine. The reason why this happened was because Bhai Rangkoji was so indifferent to, they didn't have any desire to eat anymore. They didn't have any desire to eat certain foods or just eat, they had left all desires. Obviously for us this might be seem a really long way off, you know, we're probably starving and really tired at this point. But for them, they'd lost all desire, including the desire to eat. And they were just, if they were given food, if they were given food, then they were given food. If they weren't, then it was all the same to them. So it's all about ego. So we've moved on from the disease of the mind now onto the disease of the body. So quickly going through like the scientific reasons for this. So in terms of science, you can have too many signals on the brain, you can have the wrong signals, you can have too few signals. But one of the things I've seen, the main reason that people have developed psychological diseases like anxiety and depression and stuff, is their attitude to coping with stress, the way that they cope with stress. Sometimes the way they cope with stress isn't the correct, isn't the correct way. And because of that, they develop diseases like depression. So in terms of the mind, the problems with the mind, in terms of Sikhi, what does Sikhi say about what kind of diseases you can get uh, of the mind? It says Panji Kalesh, five sort of struggles of the mind. The first one is Avidya, not knowing what the soul is, not knowing what the mind is, still thinking that we actually exist in this, uh, you know, we're this body, but not understanding that actually you're not this body, you're, this, you're the soul, this body is just uh, 
sort of like a, there to facilitate your, you know, your uh, getting, your merging back, with back, back to Maharaj. This body is there very much there to facilitate it. And as a result of not knowing and not understanding these things, we develop fear. We develop fear of death because we don't understand that we're actually immortal. The soul is not going to die. We think of ourselves so much as this body that we think we're going to die. And because of that, we develop many fears. And all the fears stem from the fear, from the fear of death. And the next thing is asamtha. Seeing everyone as equal, seeing everyone with the same sort of dristi. So, for example, if you're a Vratayan Nanga, if you're going to give, you give everyone equal portions, there's no favouring here and there, this person, or I know this person and I don't know that person. Perhaps if your mother's there, maybe I should, you know, give her the you know, best part of Nanga or something. There's, there's none of this, and because there's none of this, uh, because this is destroyed, because you, because you have Asamtha, there's no social anxiety. Because if you see everyone as, the, as, as your own or as the same, there's no vakreva between, oh, this is, I feel comfortable with these people, but I feel uncomfortable with these people. Because you see Maharaj in everyone. Maharaj says, Govind bin and Koi. There's nothing else, or there's no one else except for Maharaj. So then people don't develop these problems like social anxiety. The next one is Raab, false attachment. And this causes depression. And it's quite obvious how this causes depression because if you're attached to someone, if, let's, say, uh, let's say it's your mother. No, no let's, say, let's say you've made a friend, for example. If you make a friend, you know that. You might think that you know they're they're gonna be there forever, and you attach yourself you you attach yourself to them, just like I did with my friend. She had an accident. I thought it's a possibility that she could die, which was actually ridiculous. But we forget that the permanent state of these people, the the fact is that they're very temporary. If we remember this from the very beginning when we form relationships, that actually you know I must remain detached from all this. Then when they die, or when they leave, or when our car crashes, or when our, we lose our phones, we no longer are attached to these things. We no longer feel such sadness, such grief at their at the at their loss because we knew they were very temporary from the beginning. So that's the main. Like, that's one of the causes. That's the cause and to keep it, say depression. And the next is the having being jealous of things. This can cause obsessive compulsive disorders and ego. Up in the This is like. The fear of change, so that our ego gets in the way so many times. Our ego keeps telling us, "No, we mustn't do this. No, we we must question this. Oh, we mustn't let this happen. Or we must, you know, we have to be in control." This this control paradox. We think we're so much in control, but actually, we will feel the most suck. We'll feel some, the most happiness when we realise that we're actually not in control anymore. We're not in control at all. But our ego gets in the way of changing. Almost like we, it wants to hold on to something. It wants to hold on to itself. But once we get rid of this, then we become content. We have no desire anymore. So, what causes these diseases then, apart from this glitch, are how we deal with this, how we deal with stress. So a lot of people have problem focused, uh, you know, coping. So for example, so Karaj Baj walked into the room and I was like, okay, Baj is here, obviously someone with a lot more gown than I do. I was a bit stressed. And so I was thinking to myself, so if I have a problem focused, uh, obviously I don't want to do this Baj, but if I have a problem, I could get rid of the problem. So I could potentially get rid of Baj and I would be like, you know, stressed. <laughs> <laughs> I would really do that. But, so one way you can get rid of stress is get rid of the problem. But this is not always the case. You can't always get rid of the problem. Say you've got like a terminal cancer diagnosis. How do you get rid of the problem with that? The way you deal with that, instead of getting rid of the problem, you get rid of the, uh, you get rid of the emotional response from it. So what I did afterwards, I just thought, you know what? Baji's mild too. I'm telling all the rest of them that some will here, then Baji's also mild. And we're all one and the same. So the way you deal with it is that you change your emotions to the, uh, to the environment. So... If you know about like the five stages, so when someone gets diagnosed with something like cancer, they go through five stages of uh, you know emotions. So the first one is a denial, then they become really angry, then they bargain, and eventually the last one that they go to is acceptance. And the reason they go to everyone gets to acceptance, and that's when they deal with things, is because they know that in the end they have no control over the situation. They essentially realise that we think we have control over our things. We think that we're the ones doing this, or we came to camp, or you know, I applied for this, and that's why I got here. Perhaps I drove here. If I chose not to, then I wouldn't be here. But it's not like that at all. We think we're very much there, but it's, we're very much puppets. We just haven't realised that we've got a string attached. All we have to do, all we have to do, is look up and realise that actually there's only one person playing this game. And it's not us. We're just puppets, and you know, we are the result of my life. My says, garden, garden, grab it, hair. There's only one person that's doing anything. The only person worthy or able to do anything is Maharaj. There's no one else. And this, this fact, this control thing, the fact about losing control, it's not about losing control, it's about realising that we don't have control in the first place over anything. A really good, and it is a really good study in psychology that you may have studied. Anyone on AS level psychology or perhaps psychology? Yeah? You know Brady's Monkeys? Do you remember Brady's Monkeys? No? Anyone know about Brady's Monkeys? Yeah? So I thought it was a really, really good study to highlight control. So they had two sets of monkeys. One set, both set of monkeys. Sorry. Yeah, it was a really unethical study, and it would probably never be repeated. But back then, they, did, they cared about monkey welfare. Basically, they had two sets of monkeys, and they electrocuted 
both sets of monkeys every three or four minutes. <laughs> well, it's not a controversial. Obviously, we care about monkey welfare. But <laughs> they didn't care about monkey welfare back then. We had two sets of monkeys. One set of monkeys. They're both electrocuted every three or four minutes. But one set had no control of the situation. So they were, regardless, regardless of what they did, they were electrocuted every three or four minutes. The second set of monkeys had a lever they could press. As long as they pressed the lever every three or four minutes, they wouldn't be electrocuted. They found that they had to stop the study, like halfway through, halfway through the study, they had to stop because more than half of the monkeys in the group with the levers had died. And the reason they died was not because of electrocution, because both sets had that. The reason they died was because of stomach ulcers caused by the stress of having to press this lever every three or four minutes. The ones that had accepted that they had no control over, so they both had dock, they both had the electrocution, but the ones that accepted that they had no control over the situation were beer thicker. They were like, you know, it's going to happen regardless. They changed their emotion to it, they weren't stressed. This is a really good analogy in terms of Siki. We should really, really, if we just accept that we don't have control of the situation, we're much better for it. A really nice Saki uh, that illustrates the fact that, you know, living in the Barna Maharaj or accepting, uh, accepting that things happen and to be indifferent from them and not to have an ego is the Saki of Santhakartha Singhji's going to Satchikhand. So Santhakartha Singhji was, uh, you probably have heard Puljit Singh's talk about, um, about Duxal, no, no? Well, you will do. They, they were part, they were the head of the, an institution called Dumdumi Duxal, which is like the Sikh university and it teaches like, you know, Sikh philosophy, teaches how to read Vani. Um, and Baji will go through in detail a bit more about that. But Santhakartha Singh was the head of this institution in the 1970s. On the, on the way to Ludhiana, they were with uh, another Gursik and a driver in the car. And they got to, they were on the way to Ludhiana, and they, before about, couple, I don't know how long before, but before they got there, they told, they stopped the car, and they told one of the, uh, one of the things that was with them, I think his name was Pai Gurmuk Singhji, to swap places with him. So they swapped places, and ten minutes later, they had a car crash, and they hit a tree. The only person to be injured in that car crash was Santhakartha Singhji. When they went to the hospital, they told, the doctor told Santhakartha Singhji that they needed an operation in order to, I'm assuming it would have been to remove, like, blood from the brain or something, because if you have blood on the brain, it causes swelling and you can die from that. So in order to do this operation, they would have to remove their kids. And Santhakartha Singhji insisted that they'd rather die than even suggest the idea of removing their kids. And as a result of this, Baba Santhakartha Singhji left this world some time later and the doctors made them comfortable. But my point being here is that they were someone who truly, truly had, uh, you know, they had like illustrated the point of they had accepted death first, very not just at the point when they were told by the doctors, but right at the beginning when they took Amran, or when they, you know, whenever they, you know, had developed intellect, they'd accepted death back then. They had no itcha, they had no desire now to live or not to live. Whatever was happening to them, they accepted very much as mine at the time. So, going back to like, one of my sort of interests, which is like, I suppose, science. Uh, Studies on meditation, how there's, there's such a large scope now for the number of things that meditation assists on. Like, so it changes so much. They found that people that listen to old people that listen to religious music, they say hymns or you could say for us Gita, that they were so less, they were a lot less anxious about death. They had no uh, desire. They, people weren't worried that they were going to get if they had cancer diagnoses, they weren't worried. If they uh, were just old, they weren't worried about dying or aging. This had this a recent study. They had such a profound effect on the way they thought. Other stuff, the same did a study uh, on pain relief and uh, anxiety and depression about how, it, how people that do certain numbers of, some of them, certain number of hours of meditation have increased pain thresholds or they don't have anxiety or they have reduced anxiety and depression incidences amongst people that don't do meditation. A long time ago they did this study where they had um, uh, Buddhist monks that did a set number of hours, I can't remember how many hours, I think it was like 10,000 hours or something of meditation and they found that these Buddhist monks had, could control their blood pressure, which is really big, you might think it's a normal thing, but you can't, blood pressure isn't under our control, it's not a voluntary thing. They could control their blood pressure because of their meditation. This is just kind of a little bit about how science is now understanding the value of this. They found that this, uh, this man called Matthew Richard, who's a Frenchman, who's now turned into, who was a scientist, who's now turned into a Buddhist monk, they found that he's the happiest man in the world. And the way they quantify this was because you can do, uh, so who are people with epilepsy or like uh, brain disorders, they do this thing called an EEG, which is they measure the electrical co uh, conductors from the brain, um, how, what kind of currents are coming and stuff, and they can tell when someone's having a seizure. So they put this on this man, and whenever he was meditating, he had the highest ever recorded electrical conduction of someone ever. And they found that it's increased generally within people that meditate, but this guy had like the highest conductors in this part of the brain that makes you happy. So, you know, he was technically scientifically proven to be the happiest man in the world. I mean I don't know how accurate that would be, but my point being is that do meditating provides so much in so such such like, different array of 
uh, aspects of health. And the last thing is mindfulness. I didn't know what mindfulness was, but as a medical student, I get to speak to patients and they get to tell me about their ideas and how, how you know, different parts of the NHS have provided uh, help for them. And this, I met this woman who had um, probably in her 40s or 50s, and she had bipolar disease. And for you that don't know bipolar, it's kind of like a form of depression, if you want. It's, like, it's a psychological disease where people become really, uh, really depressed and really ma uh, manic episodes. And she was explaining that for the last, since about the age of 10 or 12, she's had this problem, she's had this bipolar disease. And for the last 40 years or so, she's had pills, she's had counselling, she's had other you know, behavioural therapies to help control the symptoms and episodes. But she said that nothing had helped. Up until a couple of years ago, she tried this thing called mindfulness. <coughs> and I did wonder what this, I was like, so, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what mindfulness is, would you mind explaining to me? And she said that mindfulness, all they're doing in this session was they gave them uh, something to focus on. So for the purpose of their experiment, they gave, uh, for the purpose, purpose of their treatment, they gave them a raisin to focus on. If anyone was at the Q&A yesterday, yesterday, you might have heard Benji explain this, Sabine Benji was mentioned this as well. But um, they gave them a raisin to focus on. So they spent 10 minutes just looking at this raisin, just focusing on the intricacies, the, you know, the stem and the actual, just like the, the folds of this raisin. And they spent 10 minutes looking at this and observing it. And 10 minutes passed like this. And then the next 10 minutes they spent eating the raisin really slowly. And all it does for them is it allows them to focus on the present. They're no longer thinking about what happened yesterday or what happened in the past and the anxieties and the, the fears they've had about you know, the, the problems they've had in the past. And they're no longer anxious about the future. They no longer have fears about what's going to happen tomorrow or what's going to happen in the future. And it's amazing that such a small aspect of Simran, the theon, the focus aspect, allows them to, you know, allows you to get so rid of so much disease just like that. And if they were to focus on something like the Shabbat, if they actually had a proper focus, how much more could they achieve from this? So, I know you're probably really tired, so I'll try to make some practice. Um, in terms of Sikhi based management then, how can we, how does Sikhi allow us to deal with stress? So there's, a, there's apparently six steps, six steps for stress management. The, I'll do the first one for you so you understand what I'm talking about. But how can, in Sikhi, how can we identify the source of stress? The way we can identify it is through Sangha. Perhaps we could do Vijaya with people that are like-minded, people that have interests in Sikhi. So, for example, if you're uh, you know, feeling a bit down lately, perhaps you know, talking to Sangha, could, they could find out what the problem is. Perhaps you don't make, but you've missed your omelette for two weeks, and you together talking about this has allowed you to understand that actually the cause of it was Perhaps my, you know, the Amrit that I missed, the, the, the support that Maharaj gives us through Amrit Vedam Bani has been removed, and now this is the reason that I feel so stressed. So the second one is a relaxing activity. Can somebody please shout out a relaxing activity in Sikhi? It's really obvious. Go on, guys. Simran. Yeah, Simran. Okay, so Simran is, uh, there are probably many others, but depending on what things you sort of like do, but Simran is the main one, relaxing activity that you can do, that allows you to focus on something and forget everything, forget the falseness that is this, the fears of yesterday, the fears of tomorrow and the problems of yesterday. Pleasurable activity. There's many, many of them, but you can name a few. Siva, yeah? Anything else? Keithan? Another one? Like Keithan? But you mentioned it's equally important. Gutha. Gutha, yeah. So listen to Gutha is also pleasurable. Okay, how can Sikhi allow us to lead a healthy lifestyle? We mentioned, I've mentioned a lot of it in the first slide about my like, body and stuff. Eat less, sleep less. Yeah, eat less, sleep less. Anything else? What else? Stuff. I heard something about staying active. Yeah, staying active, yeah. How would you stay active? Exercise, any particular seek seek types of Gut gosh, I still the yeah, these things. What about what else? What if perhaps, you know, what else allows you to stay active to keep? What are these people running around doing? Sierra, yeah. right. Sierra. Sierra's a big one. So what about talking to someone? What if you want to talk to somebody? Who do you talk to in Siki? Wow. Yeah, Maharaj. Apart from Sangha, who do you talk to Maharaj? And so how can you talk to Maharaj? Hukaram. Hukaram. How can you talk to Maharaj? Do your own Adas. Yeah, own to, so do your own Adas. And then taking the Hukaram is how Maharaj speaks back to you. What if you don't understand the Hukaram? Get someone to explain. Yeah, get someone to explain it to you. If you have access to Sikhi to the Max, uh, maybe as a basic, basic tool, if you understand more than that, perhaps go on a website like Gurmat Vijar and have a, uh, uh, download some Gatha, listen to some Gatha on that particular shab. Things are really, uh, on Gurmat Vijar, there's Gatha by Santa Gani Gurbachi seems this chronologically ordered, so you can find the Ang very easily. The number you don't have to listen to very much, you can find the Ang and then find where in the Ang the Shabbat is and uh, listen to Gatha really easily. Perhaps if you need some more help, ask someone who's more learned. Um, next one, change your negative thinking. How can you change your negative thinking in Sikhi? Yep, yeah, Sangha, yep. Yeah. How else can you, like, if you're thinking about, oh, I've got this problem, or I've got this problem, I'm so dookie, how can you convince yourself that actually you're not, you're not that dookie? 
Huh? Leave it tomorrow. Yeah, leave it tomorrow. How can you how can you actually actively change or realise that actually perhaps comparatively you're not that looking? Finding people are more looking going to like yeah. nursing home or something. Yeah, yeah, so doing some sort of CRA outside. So for example like I can thankfully like convince myself that I'm not actually that lucky, that the pains and the complex the com things I complain about are so minor because of where I work. Or where I study, sorry, like the hospital. So you can commit by doing seva of other people. You can see how you know you can actually be an instrument in doing good in someone's life, and then and then your role changes from the victim almost to the person you're helping. And you do, you know you leave this victim status. So what we learned so far, what should we do? In order to get rid of these, the ones we're doing right now, the sanjya and giri mantra, we must have we must understand this. So hopefully you're getting some sort of gyan about how we can change our karma, the giri mantra sanjya karma that we have. And the way and the gyan that we've got is that basically if you remain desireless, if you don't have any chat to be this way or that way, to eat or not eat, and I, I know that sounds very extreme to eat or not, but to sleep or not sleep, probably that's probably a good example for this camp. Anything that you have a desire to do, if you remove that desire, you no longer have the gun. If you just go as Maharaj pushes you and pulls you, it's almost like the weight, the current, is you, if you go with the current and like how Maharaj takes you, then you won't have uh, you won't create this gun. It's a really interesting grant called the Karam Bibha grant, which is like a bhati. It's no longer in print, but it's got all the karam listed in it, the, the stuff that you do, and then the file that you receive as a result of it. Um, and it, obviously, we're not, we're not, we're not, you know, we're not bothered about the intricacies about what. Oh no, I did this and that, you know, because then that means I've done this. Because you know, we leave everything to Maharaj and we, uh, you know, do nams and as a result, we get rid of our karam. But it's an inter it's interesting to see that. We might think that, oh, so what if we upset someone's feelings? Or so what if we said this to someone, or swore at someone, or we lied to them? These things carry value, and as a good sake, we must, you know, it allows you to, this grant in particular, that would allow you to understand these, uh, the, you know, the complexity of how all kind of fit together, but also the, you know, this, the, the greatness of some kind of the fact that you shouldn't perhaps you the book? Um, I can't remember, actually, when Baji probably knows. So Baji, I'm sure Baji does. Is out out of their humility, they perhaps aren't stating. No, I don't know. Okay. I don't even go to it. I can find out for you. But um, I think it might have it written on here. That's Is it by a son or a son or a marble? Um, I think it's written by uh, like proper Sikh scholars. So someone, I think from perhaps the Nirmali or uh, one, one of the Nirmali, maybe someone from there. But it's people who actually know what we're talking about. That makes sense. Um, but it's no longer in print, but it used to be. And it's, yeah, it's really, it's really like, yeah, there's many, many grants that are no longer in print. So there are some that are no longer in print, but there are others that are, you know, we just don't have access to because there aren't people learned enough to um, explain them to us, perhaps because of the English barrier or just perhaps because they're not here in this country, but there's a lot of knowledge that we don't unfortunately have in the West. So um, this is a picture of my stethoscope. <laughs> this is just to illustrate the this talk is on side of the arm. Perhaps you could cure people with the that stethoscope. Oh, that's really not. <laughs> um, okay, so the other things we can do is uh Adas, we can do job. But in addition to all this, what we can do, there's also uh, in places where Maharaj is given budget about um, particular things, or we can go to see some. And I'm just going to quickly go over these. So in terms of Barney, a lot of people read Sukhani Sahib. So this, this Bhangti Sarabaroka al Khanam comes from Sukhani Sahib. Um, in Maharaj, Sukhani Sahib is literally like a, like a, a mala of Sukh. It's like literally like a rosary breeze of beads of Sukh. It's like the you know, epitome of bliss, if you want. Reading, and many people I know read Sukhani Sahib, whether it's not just for like to get rid of gold, but just because it's so, it provides so many gifts. Uh, people uh, read the Pandini Sahib, the Shabds that Baji mentioned this morning, Jabu Sahib, and there's certain Shabds. So, like if you read a book called Sekhne here, which is the biography of um, Santa Nam Singh Ji, Rampur Kila, many, many, many of you may have read it already. I don't know if the, it's at the store, maybe it's for sale downstairs. But if you Google it, you can get access to the PDF and you can just read it. There's many incidents where, where Sangat have come to Maharaj, uh, come to Babaji, and ask them to cure them of things, cure them of certain diseases. And there's certain Shabds that they've read, you know, to get rid of these garam that are causing the diseases. So one of them was that Silma Sagar Kya So, you know, they, they read this shab many times in order to get rid of uh, someone's particular disease. So that's that shabs you can read. Um, also, Baji mentioned this morning, the Sakhi Bibi Rajani, the Pandini Bedi. And then also, there's Ram Pali Kivar. Many people read Ram Pali Kivar in order to get rid of uh, problems with their skin. So, just going quickly over Ram Pali Kivar, there were two Kirtani at the time, Guru Arjun Devji Maharaj, Pai Sattam, Pai Balavanda, and they, um, they uh, were responsible for doing Kirtan. But they got eager out of this. Someone told them that perhaps they weren't earning enough money and they were the ones responsible for the sangha that were coming to see Guru Arjun Devji. And they got eager of this, thinking that they were the reason that the sangha was coming and not see Maharaj. So they left Maharaj, thinking they could meet, make their own money themselves. And as a result, they also did Nindya Guru Nanak Devji Maharaj. And when Maharaj, Guru Arjun Devji Maharaj heard that they were doing Nindya Guru Nanak Devji, they, um, they said that anyone that associates with them should be so ashamed that they should like, you know, have ash on their face. 
and no one was to associate with these Gursikhs and uh, with these uh, with these uh, with Gitali. And as a result, they became because they did in India, they became Dukhi and they had the, you know, developed rule. But there's a Gursik at the time, Pai Dattaji, who is a really like Shardal Gursik of Gurajan Dev Jamal. She saw these two and they felt like that's on, they felt like compassion on these two, thinking that, you know, like, fine, they've done wrong, but if you're, you know, they, it's a Gursik's nature is to be compassionate upon everyone. And Pai Dattaji was like, even if it takes me having to put ash on my face and, you know, disgrace myself almost, or like embarrass myself, in order to bring them back into Sangat, in order to help them, I will do it. So he brought them back into Sangat. And then Maharaj told them, they asked our Maki from Maharaj, and Maharaj told them that from the same like, mouth that you're doing in India, if you were to, uh, you know, you should do Ustad of Gurnan Bhidhi Maharaj. So they did Ustad, they wrote Ram Bhidhi Maharaj. And Maharaj forgives people, this sort of lesson for us as well, that even if we make the biggest sins, even if we think that we're, you know, unforgivable, Maharaj is the, his name wouldn't be the great forgiver if we weren't, Maharaj wouldn't be called the like, Bakshan Hai if we weren't the ones to make mistakes in the first place. I know it seems a bit like, you know, uh, a bit contradictory that we should be making, we should be making mistakes in the first place, but we that everyone makes mistakes, but only Maharaj and Guru Sahib are the ones that don't make mistakes, and Maharaj is the one that forgives. And equally, because Maharaj uh, told them to write around the word, Maharaj also gave the word that if anyone reads this, that the, any, if they have any like, diseases of the skin, like leprosy at the time was quite pre prevalent, then they would also, that would also be eradicated. Equally, there's this place called Tarantan Sahib in Amritsar, where Maharaj, uh, someone bought Maharaj some medicine to cure, I think it was leprosy again. And Maharaj said that they poured it into the uh, Sarovar, and um, they said that if anyone has a Shanaan, particularly in Masya, a lot of people go to have a Shanaan. Masya is, I've been asked about five times, Masya is uh, a moonless night in the month. So, um, so, the, so we, in England, we have the Gregorian calendar, which is a, like a solar calendar. And in India, they have a lunar calendar, which uh, runs on the, the month as opposed to so it's the part of the month when there's no uh, there's no moon on Mars you might have heard so people have uh, Ishnan um, there at Masya. There's also another Guru Kaur in Nandir Hazur Sahib uh, where uh, Maharaj gave button about Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj gave button about how you should have you should make this dal called Har Har Dal and then do pork to it but I know we've run out of time I'll maybe perhaps Baj could explain that at some point um, the sake behind that but there's many places where Maharaj is giving button about Get rid of disease, but also the, the other thing is sand. You have heard a lot about you know how sand can cut uh, your disease, and like Maharaj, they're able to you know cut your disease. And then it says, "Do karog pay sagal binase jo aave har sant sarin." So those people that come into not just people that come into Maharaj sharin, but people that come into the sanctuary, the saints, even the people that you know that fall at the, the the feet of the saints, they're even their rog and their uh, suffering can be cut. And the way I try to illustrate it, because maybe people maybe don't understand, is that. The debt that's owed by that family. So if you've done something really bad and as a result you've got some sort of <coughs> disease because of it, you owe almost like a debt. Um, if you go to uh, Santa and they give you some sort of budget, like, you know, for example, if that debt is worth, I don't know, 10,000 Japji signs, if that debt is worth that much and you would have to do that of your own accord in order to get rid of it, the Santa almost like subsidises the debt. So they, are, because they have so much gomai of their own, they subsidise it with their own gomai and they tell you perhaps to do, to do 10 Japji signs a day. And you only have to do, say, that for 100 days or something in order to get rid of it. Whereas if you did it off your own back and tried to, it would take a lot more to get rid of that debt. So a couple of uh, sakiya in terms of sun, particularly sun close to my heart, sun of Ajit Singh and Hassan. Uh, and this is a picture of them from. This is a really good. This is what I thought was a good way of illustrating to you about how they take it all. This is a picture of them probably in their thirties, um, late twenties, thirties, forties, basically when they, when they were quite young. You can see that their face and skin is quite clear. This is a more recent picture. And because of what I study, I know that this is something called, on their face, you can see these lumps, they're called neurofibromatosis. It's like a, they're nerve cell tumours. So like the lumps are benign tumours of the nerve cells. And wherever the, you've got nerves in your skin and stuff, wherever the nerves are, that's where these tumours grow. And the saki goes that there was a girl who came into Sangat one day at Hansali, and um, she came with her parents, and her parents said to Babaji, give Babaji to see get brother and no, like, uh, you know, she's of age to get married, no one wants to marry her because, uh, because of these... Uh, Making noises. Oh, no. Is it supposed to make noises? Yeah. Okay. So All right. Okay. Um, it's not the diary. <laughs> um, and, and they said to they said to Babaji that you know that no one wants to marry her because of these lumps on her face. Babaji did get Papa. And Babaji like they said get Papa. He's like you know that's what they said. They did, don't say much. They said get Papa. And then the family were great like you know is that it like we are supposed to leave now and just go home. So then they went home and the next thing when she woke up there was nothing on her face. She woke up with absolutely nothing, and from that point on, Babaji had these uh, lumps on her face ever since. 
There are many others like here that I'm sure you can ask many good sex like Faisal Faisal Singh Ji who spent time with Baba Thakur Singh Ji. But Baba Thakur Singh Ji, all in this country and in Kanda and uh, in many other countries, had, had you know given budget like this to uh, cure uh, uh, the rogue of many, many people, many children, in fact. So, we've, we've talked about the disease of the body and the disease of the, uh, the mind, but what about disease of the soul? This, anyone know what this picture represents? What is it? It's a, it's an illusion, illusion right? So what's the biggest illusion, Mr. Key? Maya. Maya. Like the Matrix, it's almost like we live in this uh, fake world, if you want. Someone's like proper nodding, like, yes, I completely understand. Matrix is literally like really good for a job for understanding Maya. It's, it's, it's literally like the whole, this, it's almost like a, like a computer generated reality, if you want. It's all false. But it, it's very difficult for us to understand this because we're so, so imbued in, in this world. But yeah, Maya is the biggest, biggest of these. Maya come in many forms. So we've talked about the physical and the psychological diseases that each of the bind jaw, the five uh, sort of like sins, if you want, lust and anger, greed, attachment. So if you're really attached to someone, um, you know, if you're really attached to your mother, for example, if you might be constantly worried that they might be ill or that are they okay, or like a mother's worried about a child constantly. And because of this, you can get stressed and have anxiety and become quite faint-hearted. And ego is almost like the cause of all these. It's like the root cause. It's like the biggest one. So they, they increase from they increase in obviousness. They decrease in obvious obviousness. So karma is very obvious if you have you know to yourself. It's very obvious. Growth can be a bit less, and greed, and then attachment can be even less because sometimes we find it hard to differentiate between whether attachment is actually beyond. You know, you can you don't understand that. How can like being attached to my mother be wrong? Or, you know, they, they decrease in obviousness or their darkness if you want, but they increase in power. So Mara says like I've heard that like, the ego is like as thin as a butterfly wing. It's you know, it's almost like a veil of ego. We don't realise it's there until it's very much until we actually, you know, um, focus on it and realise that actually it's there. But it's very, 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 very subtle and very difficult to get rid of. So um so that comes Titi Neta Mara Hara. Mara explains in there there's many words that Mara uses for diseases, but actually they're referring to uh, they're actually referring to um, uh, psychology, uh, so, so like a uh, disease of the soul. So Maya talks about how you can get how Okad uh, Harko now I think that says that how the name of Vahiguru uh, is like the like the medicine. But what is it the medicine for? Pith. Pith is like you know how you get like um, rash on your. You might have heard the parents say you have know, pith or something. That's like a rash. But what is like a rash? Anger is like the rash. So the, the, you've got the rash of anger that this thing cures. And then you've got bad hangta. Like bad is I think is like resha uh, baldam. Is that correct word? Yeah, so um, so you've got like I don't know, Qatar like having phlegm and stuff. So Mara described that to be like greed, if you want, and Gam is in other places described to be the same way. And also you've got this hunter, this like um, you've got uh, you know the ego, all these things. Mara just now is very much the cure for these things. So in summary, and I'm sorry I've gone over. Um, the what we learned today, the main thing is to be desirous. Don't do things without any desire. Spend your lives without desire. If someone says. Do a talk on several girls with an arm, then do it. But if they say don't do it, then you know, you know, not to have a desire that I want to do this or I want to do that or you know, uh, if you have, if you do something with a desire, then you are doing it and you're creating karma. But if you do things as they come to you, then you're not. Understand that you've all been in My life, there is no one with you, with, without you. Sorry, there's no one else. It's just what, it's just why you wherever I look. And also this thing about understanding that we don't have control over things. Understanding we don't have control will make your life so much easier and so much happier because you're no longer consciously anxious about uh, everything. And fall in love with my life, do save our book. Why would you fuck us? Quickly, I just forgot, there's another slide. <laughs> right, this tree uh, is a borda draft, it's like a banyan tree, I think that's what they call it in English, banyan tree. Um, and uh, Santhi and Guru Bajan Singh said a really interesting, interesting thing about. Uh, the amount of karam or the number of karam that we need in order to be born as a human. So the number of branches there are on this tree is the number of karam we need in order to be born as a human. The number of fruit on this tree, there's probably many, many, many thousands of fruit I'm guessing, are the number, of, this tree is very big, I mean, you can see that woman in the corner. The number of fruit that this tree has is the number of karam that you need in order to be born as a Sikh family. And the number of seeds in all of the fruit on this tree are the number of karam that you need to have in order to be able to take omri. We think, we think these things are easier and we'll take on with one day in the future, perhaps when we've got less responsibilities or less you know, issues to deal with. But these aren't things of our own, we're not doing of our own accord. You only can do this if you actually have such great kirpa. Much like yourselves, you only have, you have such great kirpa in order to be here in the first place, in order to get my dashan and sangat of um, gursiks that are you know, so well-read and so uh, educated about issues. 
because armed people don't have this. If you look around, like, you know, people are struggling with so much in terms of disease, so many different types of diseases, they don't have access to this, they don't have access to much. Five years ago.